Hi, I'm Siwafili Rose Amador LeBeau, and we're here in Washington State on the Squaxin Reservation. So we're very, very happy to be here and excited to learn about all the wonderful things the tribe is doing. And I'm here with Charlene. How do you say last thing? Christ. 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 Charlene is the director of the museum here, and there's a just a wealth of things to look at here. So we're going to walk around and show you as much as possible. But Charlene, thank you for having Native Voice here. We're oh. really happy to be here. Oh, we're so honored to have you here. We want to learn so much about your tribe. It just looks so rich. Can you tell, tell me a little bit about yourself and then tell me about the tribe. My name is Charlene Kreiss. My native name is Kwithlapi, which means um, mist on the water. And my people, we are people of the water, marine waters from the Pacific Ocean come all the way into the southern reaches of the Salish Sea. And our people have inhabited this area for thousands of years. My family, we've been here for thousands of years, so our, um, my family lineage goes back many generations. And on my father's side is where I come from is the Medicine Creek Nation, oh. which is Squaxin, Esqually, Puyallup. On my mother's side, I come from the Colville Confederated Tribes. And my mother has lineage to the Nez Perce uh, mm -hmm. that were placed in Nez Pelham after they were imprisoned. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's in Oklahoma. Then they came to Nez Pelham to stay, and that's some of the lineage that my family has uh, from my mother and father. Oh, wonderful. And you are the director of the museum. I am. I uh, became the executive director in uh, 2000. And uh, the reason uh, I was chosen, so I was told, is because I carry a lot of history. And mm -hmm. I've spent years of my time talking with the tribal elders and taking notes. I'd be out fishing, and um, we had these tickets or kind of gold color tickets and they have the weight and they have all this information and you sign it and when I'd sit with elders I wanted to remember what they said so I'd write down on oh, these tickets nice. and then if I were meeting with them at a uh, luncheon I'd use the placemats and write my notes and so I took notes through the years and gained a lot of understanding of not only the historical but generational trauma, mm -hmm. about the business aspects, the religious uh, reasons why we do the things that we do, and um, I learned about the foods. And Do so you speak the language? I don't speak the language fluently. Mm -hmm. My grand aunt used to babysit me, and so I learned the language, And um, but when I was younger, I was put into like a speech therapy because mm -hmm. they said my language yeah. was so <laughs> rough. And, um, uh, but here's a story I wanted to share with you is we had a language class in the classroom. I walk in and it's an immersion, so you're not speaking English, you're just speaking the Lushitsid. <clears throat> and as I come in, the teacher, he's telling the story. And I had heard the story as a little girl. And so I got all these goosebumps and you know how people, they say their hair stands up. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way it felt, and, and I knew what he was saying. And, but I couldn't always enunciate those words, mm -hmm. but my spirit, my mind knew the story. And I sat down, and I was just quiet, and I couldn't tell everybody, oh my goodness, uh, it's, it's coming here. back to me. Yes, yeah. it's right here. And uh. so that's my story. So do, they, do you teach the children the language now at the center here, at the cultural center? We um, have children that do come up. We also go down to the child development center. We have elders mm -hmm. that go down and we have an um, assistant director that also will share the history, uh, the uh, language. And they share the language through the songs and through oh, the dance good. and have photos of the kayas, which are the mm -hmm. grandmothers, and the sapas, which are the grandfathers. And so we try to create like a visual for the young people, uh -huh. especially the toddlers, to, to mm -hmm. learn the language. Oh, good. And teaching them to count and to sing and so that they have a, a connection and an endearment to the language. So tell me, um, give me the history of your tribe 
and how all of this came about. Okay. Our tribe is a very ancient tribe. Some of the artifacts that are here have been dated several thousands of years old. Some of the um, studies that have been done on um, some of the, we have a well-bone club here that's dated 2,500 years old. We have rocks that just look like plain old rocks, but mm -hmm. they're petroglyph rocks. And in these rocks are carvings, and they've been dated several thousands of years old. Wow. Our people say that from time immemorial, meaning so far back into time, that we have this history. And the history is a spoken history. But the history also is about the connection to the earth. Mm -hmm. And our history also includes those ceremonies. Ceremonies for tribal people are very important because they keep alive that connection of this is why we do these things to honor the earth, to honor the sacred ones, the animal mm -hmm. nations, the plant nations. And so our people have this connection to the land right now. A lot of the land is majority of the land actually, is owned by non-tribal people. Really? However, in, in our ancestral areas, uh -huh. um, we have cities, we have roads, and everywhere where our people have the legends and the stories that go with the landscape, that go with the waters, the rivers, and the, the valleys. And so um, our people, we have these, the connection back to the land, um, in the 19, uh, early 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1700s, the Royal British Navy came through. And when they came through to our area, our people went out to the beach and they came out in their, their, glor their beautiful regalia, which means their robes mm -hmm. and their feathers on their head and their, their face paint, you know, like how mm -hmm. we prim and, you know, kind of take care of ourselves, um, our tribal people put on their red ochre, their black glimmer, and came to greet these new people because we were fascinated with them too. Mm -hmm. We were fascinated about their boat, their, their skiff, and fascinated about the way they looked, their eyes, and so the people came out to greet them, and this was in the 1700s. This was written in um, uh, Peter Puget's journals and another man by the name of Menzies. And they wrote about the encounter with our people from the Tupics and the Elden Led area. Mm -hmm. And when they met them, the Peter Puget said the site was horrific. Meaning it was, oh. he couldn't believe the regalia and the, the black glimmer, the red ochre. So it was and scary to them. It was scary <laughs> to them. And then afterwards, he wrote in his journal, he equated it to the Lords of England how in England they have the powdered wigs and they powdered their face yeah. and the yeah. perfume bodies and so that's what he equated it to. And during this time when they met with our people, they noticed all the beautiful women. These men had been on the ship for about five years. So they got all these gifts and tried to present it to the women and the women wouldn't even engage, no. And so in the journal they wrote how that even though Christianity hadn't arrived to the tribal people at this time. Their standards and their ethics of how that they would take care of themselves is very high. That was kind of one of the first encounters. Our tribal people, we traded with them. We, um, uh, we are people of the land. We have elk herds that were huge back then and so our people had these vests that would keep the people warm, especially the men. They were called clamens, and on these clamens would be uh, ornate drawings of, of the animal nations. And so this was traded out with the people. Um, so our people, we are, our ancestors, very strong in the um, knowledge of the waterways, the tidal systems, and how it interacts with the, uh, the weather, mm -hmm. the wind, and the changes of the season. And so being people of the water, there was a maritime knowledge that was part of our of who we are as uh, Salish water people, sea, Salish sea people. Um, 
our people, um, the ancestors, had quite a knowledge of the natural science of the land. So with that knowledge came the ability to build uh, large buildings called longhouses. Our people also had um, pit houses that mm -hmm. utilized the earth and um, rooftops would be put on these pit houses and they would be structured in a way so that the houses wouldn't be filled with water because up here it rains quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So the tribal people had quite a, a strong society and this society also had longevity of life because of that relationship with the earth. Our people had the ability to live beyond 100 years old, 120 really? up to 140 yeah. years old. And when I talked to the elders, they said, this was because of the social structure, but the honoring of the food, the first foods, honoring of our, our uh, relationship with the land, but mm -hmm. with one another. And it was able, it helped us to have that longevity of life. So the, our Squaxin people, we are people of numerous watersheds of the Southern uh, Sound, the marine waters of Washington State. And our people um, had such a strong connection to the land that um, the elk, the deer, the, the bears, the, all the wildlife and the plants were very important to us. So our, our teachings are very much connected back to the land. If you notice here on the wall, we have kind of a reddish brown. That's right. to signify that we are of this earth and that red ochre is this color. And then you have to fire it up and mm -hmm. we mixed it with our different oils that would come from either the seal or the um, salmon and that would become the paint. The tribal people had this relationship with the land that we had a teaching is still strong here. It's called Gutsare. Gutsare is a teaching of the body, mind, soul, spirit. It's like the four directions that a lot of mm -hmm. tribal people have. <clears throat> Our four directions would be the infant, child, adult, elder, spring, summer, fall, winter. Mm -hmm. And the changes of the season, our people would live in these changes of season, meaning that they were like natural scientists that they could determine when the change was about to come and how important it was to prepare for the food. Our tribe, we are of the Medicine Creek Nation, Squaxin, Nisqually, and Puyallup, a huge nation. Our tribe, Bo Nation, was one of the wealthiest nations here in Washington State. We had the spawning beds, the creeks, that are down here in the southern um, reaches of the marine waters called the Salish Seas. We had these wonderful watersheds that were just abundant in elk and deer, and mm -hmm. we had um, pharmaceutical lands that were just so fertile with the wonderful medicines necessary for taking care of one another. Mm -hmm. um, these pharmaceutical lands would be acres and acres and they would be tended by people that had a love for the plants and that understood that the plants are like other nations of people and it was their responsibility to take care of it. But it also was their responsibility to watch out for the changes of the season mm -hmm. because to keep this land so fertile at the time of when the change was about to happen from summer to fall, from fall to winter, mm -hmm. fires would be set deliberately to start, uh, slash fires, to start the burning of the land so that um, it would add more um, nutrients to, to the land to make it more fertile. Mm -hmm. So our people had this connection, this relationship to the land that helped the longevity of the people, but also here, we are so connected to the marine waters, an abundance of salmon, so many salmon that some of the salmon were about, if we stood them from the tail up to their, their nose. Oh my goodness. They, they would be like <laughs> so five large. feet tall. They were huge. Was that mainly the diet, um, fish? Salmon, elk, deer, and shellfish. 
We have here gooey ducks, and these are huge gooey ducks. So are they ducks? No. They're, they're fish called they're, gooey ducks. They're, they're shellfish. <laughs> they're shellfish. I saw a couple of pictures of them. It's like, wow, I've never seen that before. <laughs> they're gooey ducks. They're gooey ducks. And our people call them gooey ducks because when you're out on the, on the beach, it almost sounds like that's what they're saying. Oh, is it just funny? Like, yeah, like they're talking, uh -huh. so we call them gooey duck. Um, these gooey ducks are huge, and our people uh, really like them because they're a mild taste. We have oysters. Oysters to our people are just an important part. These we had uh, these small oysters that were smoked uh, in uh, smokehouses, and the, they would be strung into necklaces and be traded all over so people could share the, the taste of the oysters. Um. And of course we had our clams. Our tribal people call the shellfish the good medicine. And I asked some of the elders and they said whenever you're feeling not, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when you're not feeling so well, if you have your shellfish, it's good for you. So. We did a research here, and what we found out is that in shellfish are these, it would be like baseball mitts that would capture the uh, iron, and it helps your body to metabolize it. Really? And, yes. And so shellfish for people are so important to maintain your, your strength and your, you know, People j joke around about the Lawrence Well Geritol. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had some of your sh shellfish yesterday oh, okay. at the uh, the restaurant here to die for. <laughs> yes, it is so delicious. Um, mile per mile, our tribe had the most productive shellfish beaches, mm -hmm. um, and so our tribal people were very wealthy, and because of having so much wealth, we would hold these ceremonies called potlatchen. Potlatchen was a gift and ceremony. So if I were thinking of you and everybody else uh, to come to my potlatch, I'd be thinking of each one individually of what they like, what they do, and I would start making these items for mm -hmm. you or preparing the, the gifts of smoked clams for you and making sure that when you came to the potlatch, I'd be given all these items as a gift to you, and that was our potlatchen. Mm. And one of the elders said, our potlatchen was very important because it was gifted to everyone so that if someone were struggling, like a, a woman who was widowed or uh, someone who was going through a difficult time, that this would be a social structured way to give to them without making them feel uh, needy bad. or ne that needy. Yeah. And so the potlatchen ceremonies would go on for days. And these ceremonies were vital for showing people that we have this knowledge. So <clears throat> the academic knowledge is different in our society where it began when the, the child was an infant mm -hmm. and they were in that cradle board and the child would start their literacy. And their literacy would be, is they would be looking at items and watching and seeing what they like and don't like. And parents were very careful of who would come in that view of that child. So that child was protected. But the child as he or she grew older would gain more literacy on what was happening. Seeing mom or dad working on carving or mom working on a basket that was the beginning of the literacy of where inside that child would be instilled the importance of um, the way of life, mm -hmm. the Godzad, the teachings of the ancestors. And the Palachan had so many components to it that are vital even today to our people that the tribal people would host these Palachan for sharing the knowledge um, it would be almost like a broad news cast mm -hmm. where people would take the floor and yeah. they would say, um, I want to share with you that uh, I was just informed and they would tell what was happening. Mm -hmm. or We made a new discovery and tell what was going on. So the potlatchen and the big houses were very important. 
and um, Squaxin Island tribe, we were known as one of the, the, the big people, the Siops, important people for Gifton because we did a lot of Gifton of the items. <clears throat> How many tribal members do you have? Right now we have about 1,300. In the 1960s it was only about 150. 1970s, about 200 plus. 1980s, it just grew. We oh, were good. considered such a small tribe that in the late 1950s, early 60s, the federal government thought they should terminate us because they didn't think we were acting as a tribe. However, we showed, we could show that from the 19, early uh, 1900s, our people had learned about writing and English mm -hmm. and keeping notes and so we had um, people that would take photographs and but also that kept notes of uh, tribal council meetings mm -hmm. in the early 1900s and that we kept that up all through the years. However, in the 1960s, they wanted every tribe to fall under constitutions. So the tribe um, uh, uh, started working on our constitution. Ah, okay. Um, I wanted to share that as the years moved along, 1700s, now that we're into the 1800s, more and more people are coming into this territory. At, in the 1800s, Washington State was known as the Oregon, Oregon Territory. Mm. And I was told by an, by an elder that the Columbia River was known as the Oregon. And there was a ceremony at the Oregon that was a water ceremony where they would take the burl from a tree. Sometimes you see trees that have a, mm -hmm. a, a growth. They'd cut that and make it into a bowl or cups mm -hmm. and they'd place it into the Oregon and they would thank the Creator for the gift of the water. So here, Washington State and Oregon, we have a lot of rain and the rain is so good for the land because it creates a lot of dense forests. And so when the people followed the Oregon Trail, uh -huh. I, it's so important for them to know that the Oregon Trail wasn't just about the state, but the Oregon, the water, is so important that we as, no matter what nation of people we are, we need to have respect for the water. And so here in Washington State, being people of the water, mm -hmm. uh, Squaxin Island Tribe, as more and more people came across the Oregon Trail and they came up to this area, our people were very hospitable. And we would share with the early pioneers, the newcomers, what was here in this beautiful land. And many of the elders equate this area that we live in as the Garden of Eden, because whatever you wanted, was here. Mm -hmm. You could have the, the best foods, the potatoes, the carrots, the onions, everything was here. And so the tribal people say, we have always lived in one of the wealthiest areas, meaning the land. So <clears throat> when the people came into this area, they um, uh, became good friends with our tribal people. And our tribal people created and had a strong bond, a friendship of trust, because we were the ones that helped bring in those babies to the world. And it was our people that shared the medicines mm -hmm. when the people would get hurt and would be ill. We would share our foods and medicines with them. And so when the more and more people came into the territory, um, the federal government came to the Medicine Creek Nation and said, could you have all your people come to one area? So the tribal people said, well, we'll go to Shinanam, which is now we call it the Nisqually Delta. So everyone went to this area. It's a beautiful area, Mount Rainier's <clears throat> in the distance. And then you have the, the marine waters to the north. And, mm -hmm. and it's just a beautiful valley. and. And so everyone met there in the month of December, which up here in Washington State, the month of December usually is very cold. So the tribal people, when they met with the federal negotiators, they came in their regalia, all 
uh, ready for an important work. And when they came in, they were expected to hear Arlo Schutzseed language. And no. And then they thought maybe English? No. Nope. The federal government chose to negotiate the treaty in a language called Chinook jargon. And for our people, the Chinook jargon was a intertribal bartering language. It would be like if you went to Wall Street, they had all these acronyms to, to oh do this gosh. exchange. And so the tribal uh, Chinook jargon here in the Northwest was widely used by all these tribes because here in the Northwest, we have so many tribes, and they all speak different languages. Right. So uh, our people would have to learn several languages just to uh, talk with one another because of the, the um, so many tribes. So the Chinook jargon was the language that was spoken at the Treaty of 1854. When the language was, um, when the negotiation started, the tribal people were promised many things verbally. And because our language is a spoken language, our people had memory keepers there that said this is what was said. And then it took, uh, and it, a lot of the tribal people did not agree mm -hmm. with the treaty. You can imagine. Some of them were like, oh no. And what it would take would be a, a, a pat on the back from a friend, a non-Indian friend, or it would take a nod at the head of like, yeah, it's all right. And then the tribal people would put their X by the treaty. And, well, some people, they uh, still distrusted what was being put before them. With um, good reason. Oh, yeah. So the treaty took two years from this area, Oregon Territory at that time, to go all the way back to Washington, D.C. and come back two years. During this two-year time, all this his historical things were happening. Gold was being found in California. Gold was being found in Alaska. Of course, you had the gold in the Black Hills, mm -hmm. in South Dakota, North Dakota. And then now, there was talk of gold here. And so the elders said, with all this going on, and all the corrupt talk that happened, that so many things were promised, that our tribal people, the Squaxin people, were promised this area where it has black hills, and it's a very beautiful area. And this is what one of the elders said, that this was supposed to be part of our reserved land, because mm -hmm. our people had given up thousands and thousands of acres of land. and. Um, but by the time the treaty came back, the land that was reserved for our people was a five-mile island, two miles wide. And on this island, we already knew this, there were, it did not contain the medicines, the foods, or the running water, the creeks, the rivers, so necessary for the people.